Hi everyone, I'm Steve Lochran, also known as Steve L, usually at Apache Codebase. I am here to talk about Hadoop and Kerberos. The title of this talk is Hadoop and Kerberos, The Madness Beyond the Gate, for reasons that will become very clear to anybody that ever works with Hadoop and Kerberos. This is me. I used to be happy. I used to have a <laughs> happy life and just generally live a life of my even some I was actually doing Hadoop development, I was writing code, it all worked, I wrote things, I was happy, it was good, the test passed, and then we shipped. And my life was uncontrolled chaos from then on, really. It hasn't really stopped. But because generally what happens is you get obscure messages saying some random bank can't run your code, it's giving you an error message that makes no sense, can you fix it? And it's like, well, no, not really. And it, it's only, you know, Kerberos is often the, the cause of all grief. And the problem is, is that, of course, yes, it all worked well in development. I ignored all the security stuff because it just all worked. And as soon as you find out, you get the real world, you find that your code doesn't work, by which time it's too late to fix. All you can do is lose all your free time. Anyway, this is your last chance to, I'm going to describe what goes on. You may leave the building right now if you, or go to another talk if you really don't want to know what's going on, okay? I won't be offended, all right? Because once, once you discover this, you'll never trust Hadoop to work in a secure cluster ever again. Last chance to run off, okay, there you go. Right, Hadoop security. Um, when Tom wrote his first book, he had to struggle with the secure section, but he was so glad when someone wrote a book called Securing Hadoop, Secure Hadoop Clusters, that was it, wasn't it? And that was really good. Um, I actually have like the early edition one that basically says we just glossed out chapter two, which just says chapter to come, securing distributed systems. And really, that's a summary of distributed system security in general, actually, is we still haven't fully worked it out. The securing Hadoop cluster book was very good, secure Hadoop clusters, but it actually glossed over the problem of what happens when your things don't work. You all do this and it's secure and your life is better. It doesn't ever say your life's not going to work. How the hell do you start beginning to debug it? The problem is, is that you can't ignore that because all the major Hadoop clusters, outside short-lived cloud ones, bear that in mind, but all the big standard physical Hadoop clusters, we turn, security is kind of critical in Hadoop. That means Kerberos is the foundation for security, which means Kerberos is turned on. <coughs> you have no control about whether you encounter Kerberos or not. You can control when it happens. You can either say, I will do it during development, I will do it during QA, I would do it 24, 36, 72, or 72 hours or seven days after we turn on our application, because th those are the trouble spots, actually. One day, two day, three day, and a week. Top tip, turn Kerberos on on a Tuesday. You'll work out why if you actually pull the number through. So the point is, it's there, it exists, and it's going to make your life hard. What is Kerberos? Well, it was written in the 1980s by MIT, same people that gave us the X window system. And they thought they were being witty when they named it after Cerebrus Kerberos, which was a three-legged dog that guarded the gateway to hell. They thought they were being witty. In fact, they were actually documenting it. Uh, you know, because that's basically it. I actually don't like to use the Greek mythology. I like to use the H.P. Lovecraft's mythology instead. Hands up, anyone who's read any H.P. Lovecraft stories ever? Okay, you'll get the joke, okay? Um, or again, not really joke, more kind of documentation. Um, for those who don't know, H.P. Lovecraft was an author based in New England in the 1930s. He wrote a collection of horror stories, which basically, they're a bit repetitive, but generally some innocent, civilised man, or a man, usually H.P. Lovecraft. Humanity, and they'd suddenly discover that in fact civilization was a thin veneer over a dark, unroiling mass of kind of pre-human deities and not maliciousness, but just things that would just crush humanity in their way, and civilization was just a thin bubble of stuff on top. The authors would, protagonists would then invariably go mad or live in fear of their little attic of things scraping on the window at night to drag them into the underworld, and we call them sepulchres. So effectively, everything that H.P. Lovecraft wrote in the 1930s was effectively documentation. Because, you know, MIT came out of New England, drives you mad bizarre manuscripts that will just drive me mad if you read, and that's the RFCs. So, if you start working with Hadoop, go read the H.P. Lovecraft novels and consider them documentation. Because Kerberos is the gateway to darkness. Uh, 
key concept. There's something called a Kerberos domain controller, the KDC. It's noticeable the two special things to bear in mind here. Well, normally there's the MIT one, and there's another one called Heimdall. But generally, firstly, it's run by your organization's network or security ops team who don't really trust anybody in general um, for a living. Well, paranoid for a living. It's like a, you don't get, you know, otherwise there wouldn't be security people. Often even worse, it's Active Directory, which is a piece of Windows stuff that security people are around, and you have to talk to it. It's enterprise-wide. They won't really loosen it up a bit just for your convenience. And Hadoop integrates with it, utterly depends on it to the point that if it's not working, your code doesn't work. The Kerberos protocol is a way designed to let things, principles, authenticate with each other to say, I'm, you know, you, I'm a person, Steve, you are a service, Hadoop name node, whatever, Hadoop HGFS, I agree that you are who you say you are, you agree that I'm who I say I am, let's start communicating either, maybe securely, like encrypted, but at the very least, so we trust each other. So it's about, it's not encryption, it's, it's not authorization, it's authentication. Are you who you say you are. It doesn't do this using nowadays, oh, it'll be with certificates and RSA and that. It's not, it's done by shared secrets. More similar to OAuth, actually, in some respect. But it means that there is a shared secret, a secret password <coughs> kept in the Trevor of the main controller, and you, the user, have it as well. So what happens is you, the user, you log in to the Kerberos of the main controller and get something back a ticket, as it's called, which you can then use to authenticate with another service to say, I've been given this ticket, so trust me. There is some bit of math here, I'll demonstrate it. Basically, I log in saying, this is me, I want to talk to this specific service called a ticket granting service, and this is when I am. KDC sends back a message saying, here are some numbers that you can decrypt, provided you have that same secret key that I have. Okay, so it encrypts it sends it back, sends it back to you. You end then have this ticket, which you then pass on to the service you want to talk to, which says, I'm Steve, I want to talk to you, here is the information you have. And it's encrypted using their secret key, so then they can actually understand, they, they say actually, yes, this person's who they say they are, they have this ticket, and the domain controller says who they are. Now, the fun thing is, is that, one, tickets expire. They have a limited lifespan. That means if somebody actually steals your ticket, there's a limited amount of damage they can do. The other thing is, is that you talk to this authentication service once for a while, and then it lasts for a few days. But it doesn't grant you access rights to talk to everything in the system. Instead, you talk to this thing here, the ticket granting service, to say, I want to talk to something like HGFS, like the Yarn execution engine, like HBase. And every time you talk to that, you talk to the ticket granting services saying, give me a ticket. So you kind of, you bootstrap, but tickets are the secret. And they can also be passed around. Once you've got a ticket, talk to it. Say, HBase, I could give that ticket to another person, to another program, and it would have my identity as far as talking to HBase goes, but it wouldn't be my identity as far as talking to HGFS goes. So they're slightly, they, can be de they can be handed off. Other cool thing, notion of principles. Kerberos has a bit like domains of something called Realm. It can be short letters, Christian Capital, and then you have the username in front of like Alice at Realm, Bob at Realm. Those kind of names are usually real users. In a cluster, we tend to actually split things up to service and host, HGFS slash, and then the host line, rack for service well, that kind of thing. The reason we do that, and actually, if you ever configure new clusters, you just use underscore capital H to say map it in, is because if you have 10,000 node cluster with the same user HGFS and you bootstrap the cluster, that's the user trying to log in from 10,000 different machines. Your Kerberos domain controller will recognize that as an attempted brute force guess of the password and will just disable the user for security reasons and page the ops team. So in fed, you have separate names and even then there's some log, some back off code to try and deal with overloading the domain control. Security ops people don't like it when 10,000 machines trying to log in simultaneously, by the way. Upsets them. Anyway, if you have a Hadoop cluster, you can turn Kerberos on by pressing a button. This is Ambari. Hadera Manager does the same thing. There's a button called Turn Kerberos On. It's very easy to turn that button on. You can never press the Leave button. There's never, there's never a Disable Kerberos button. Okay, it's a one-way path to oblivion. 
and it runs all the way through the system here. I'm about to give this an animated video here. This is actually, this, this PowerPoint slide is the current official normative documentation of how this works. Uh, you think I'm joking, don't you? Uh, I have to basically spend a lot of time getting this animation right. Um, all right, so you, the user, you only have secrets and passwords and logins. That doesn't work for your services, so we save all our secrets in something called a key tab. That gets issued by this cur by the ops team. It's a binary file that contains a list of principles and uh, their secrets, their passwords. So a key tab. It's kind of <laughs> precious, okay? Even though the expiry is the point is that you lose that key tab, you've lost all the, all the passwords in there. So normally what happens is that in a large cluster, they get distributed around by the ops team onto the individual clusters in your hosts, given the access rights. And then when a service like HGFS, the file system starts up, hands up, who knows what HGFS is? I forget what it is. Okay, it's a distributed file system. You can go to Dave Cliff's lectures and discuss it. Key point is we have something called a name node at the top, which is the metadata server. It knows the directories, the file names, all that kind of stuff. It's the ones you start talking to. We have these things down here, the data nodes that store all your data, and they replicate copies of it, they chat amongst each other. So when you read and write data, you work with these data nodes. When you want to open a file, you go to the name node, and it tells you where it is. But the way I have to do it, we have to say there's no trust in the system. I don't want a malicious machine coming up and joining this file system and say, hey, trust me, give me some data. That wouldn't work. Similarly, they need to know they're talking to the real name node. Otherwise, if they get requests from name node saying delete these, delete these blocks, that would actually destroy data. So there is no, right from the beginning, they don't trust each other. So they come up. They all log in to say, yeah, give me a ticket. And they get their tickets back. <coughs> then they start going, oh, I want to talk to the name node. OK, well, you can go and talk to the name node. And they get their ticket back. Then they start chattering amongst each other, saying, yeah, you are, you are who yeah, you say you are. I am who I say I am. At least if you really are who you promise to be, then you can understand me. Then they share some secret information called exported block keys, basically a mutual table of where data lives, and some index into it, and they're all happy. That's Kerberos tickets, that's they bootstrap. But the next step becomes this process called tokens. This is interesting because these aren't Kerberos tickets, they're Hadoop tokens which are very similar. Nobody understands the difference. You just gloss over it really saying tickets and tokens. <coughs> but I like to use them, they're a bit like more like hotel keys. They're more anonymous. You can pass them to other people and if you don't pay your money they can get revoked on a whim. So, and it's, the reason they exist is partly to help delegate rights more but also partly to avoid overloading those Kerberos domain controllers. A large Hadoop cluster, like the Facebook ones, are probably the largest single Kerberos systems on the planet, and they tend to overload bits of infrastructure. So a lot of this stuff is kind of delegate, broken up a bit, just to deal with, basically to deal with scale. So all different services running the cluster, the file system, other applications that work, they issue tokens. You authenticate with using Kerberos tickets, and then you get a token back saying, I'm who I say I am. And you use that for the rest of the conversation over RPC or HTTP. But also, you can get a transitive one saying, give me this token. I want to be valid for two days. Pass it on to this other person, this other service, to say, right, I can give it as part of an AP RPC call, say, here is my token. You may <coughs> now access these files on my behalf for the next six hours. And that service can have it, and it can keep renewing it for a while. To say, OK, I've still got it. I'd like it refreshed. I'd like it refreshed for a day or two. And also, I can say, right, I don't want that anymore. I've had the server do something for me. Now delete, destroy that token. And the server, the service will kind of remove it from its list of valid tokens. So it's, it's integral to the system is this notion of tokens. <coughs> Key example here is I actually want to talk to the file system. So the user Alice wants to talk to, read a file from here. She opens up a file. This is all it. Oh, OK, first learn to trust each other. Then says, right, open the file. The name node doesn't actually have the data. What it does is gives a token back to Alice that says, you now have the permissions to find, work out where that data is, and then talk to any of these nodes that have a copy of data. And it replicates data. This could be any file that would be three copies of it somewhere. And says, right, go talk to it. You go talk to one of those, and you pass it on and says, I'm who I say I am. I have been <coughs> given the permission to read this file. And that permission is valid for an hour. And that's how you do it. So we, we use tokens integral into the API. Okay. And we can delegate. This is where it becomes more fun. So this time, I want to actually add another service here. Like, any, say some services happen that I give 
like Uzi the workflow service to say, right, this can read a file for Steve's for a while. Now, instead of getting a block token, I said you get a delegation token, which says this service can act on my behalf for four hours. It chats to each other there, uses it to authenticate there, and now it gets the block token to read things and to talk to the file system itself. So it doesn't have my Kerberos secret. It can't ask for more things to it, but it has, it has restricted access purely to HDFS for a while. And that, that's how, in a very large distributed system, we pass our identity on to other applications for, for, the, for the life of our work. It, it gets complicated, but it ensures that it's how you work in a secure system. You actually have to say, if something's doing something on my behalf, it needs my file system permissions, my access to different services, my HBase rights, and it propagates around. Where it becomes real fun, this is probably going to scare people, and is mostly relevant to writing <coughs> applications in this world, I warn you, is imagine I'm writing an application to get deployed around the cluster. Hadoop clusters, we have an application launcher. People would say it's a bit like Mesos and Kubernetes. It's similar-ish, but it's designed to run your code near the data. Good way to summarize it. So to run code in this world, you upload your binaries to the HDFS cluster. Then you talk to something called the Yarn Resource Manager to say, I want some space in the cluster to bring up my little application. And first, you get one place where you run your application. And that piece of code comes up, and then it comes up, and it's in charge. It can actually ask for more capacity in the cluster, <coughs> more machines, more slots, more CPU time, more, more kind of stuff. And you, you know, and where you want it, and it runs your application in the cluster. So, in this world, then I have to say, right, I want to let user Alice run a program in her on her behalf, like a large MapReduce Hive Spark job, for example. And then that application will start using resources and, and reading and writing data as Alice. So that's the moment I'm going to deploy a Spark application. First, you have to go through all the boring authentication stuff. It's not been done already. This time, Alice says, give me a delegation token. Now, I'm going to talk to resource manager and create something called a launch context. This is basically the list of all binaries to download to run my program, the command line, the environment variables, and any of the security credentials needed to actually access services within the file system. That's not just HFS to files, it's things like Hive, it's things like HBase. Anything else you need to talk to that lives in the security world, you have to get the delegation tokens, stick them in a the launch context, and hand them off to the resource manager. The resource manager will eventually find somewhere in the cluster where there is capacity for you. And it says, right, find one of the machines in the cluster, it'll know manager is trusted and says, run this program, download it, execute your program, here are the credentials to come with, takes everything that's been passed on and added an extra one, an AMRM token. Don't worry about the acronyms. So, it goes to HGFS, using the credentials, acting as Alice to download the files, you can't download anyone else's files, and runs it. It basically downloads the executables, sticks them in the local file system now, that we're doing some software <coughs> launching as well, as the user in the cluster, user Alice, actually runs the code, passing down those tokens as well. And so now, when that program starts, it has the credentials needed to access the file system as Alice. So basically, the end user has grabbed the credentials, looped around here to actually download the code. Now your program, SparkJob, is running in there, reading her files with her permission, and being able to talk to the resource manager on behalf of Alice as well. So this process here in Spark. Executor says, right, I need eight more containers. I want to run more at Spark Executors. It asks resource man, say, right, give me some more capacity in the cluster to run code. They come up, and again, you pass those credentials down to it. So now the Spark Executors working with data in HGFS, they get that same credentials. So you're basically passing these tokens around all the time. You also, as your application runs for a while, you need to refresh the tokens that expire. And effectively, you, this bit, the Yarn Resource Manager, built into the protocol from the beginning. There is nothing in there right now to do with things like updating your HDFS token. They just expire, and they're pretty much lost forever. That's for security <coughs> reasons. It means if you're trying to run a long-lived application, you are absolutely stuffed. Roughly. Approximately stuffed. Now, What's happening under the, under the hood? Well, 
there is something, there is a lump of code called user group information, which everybody in the new code base is scared of. I mean, this is not, it's not a joke, is it, Tom? <coughs> no, he's not shaking his head. Everyone's scared of that code. Because A, it's ugly. B, it's brittle. Three, nobody wants to go near it because they'll feel support calls related to it forever. And the thing is, it's, it's incredibly integral to secure clusters. You basically say, is security turned on? That little predicate there absolutely turns on everything. It tries to log you in. It does all the preamble, the setting up, talks to the Kerberos controller, all that kind of stuff. And if it goes, no, if security's off, you can write a line of code that doesn't need a secure cluster at all. And that, because as developers, we tend not to test on secure clusters, that's the code we actually develop and test. Unfortunately, it's the other branch, security turned off, is the one that turns up in production. Anyway, that's Kerberos. So the API, an API is a notion of that about users. Your code can say, give me who I am. Login user and current user. Login user is the identity of the principle that started a program. The current user is the one that actually your code is acting as, which can be different. So we'll do that delegation tokens. Because what can happen is I can get an RPC call coming in saying, right, I've been, I, even though I was a service launched by Alice, I've been given the authority to act on, do something with Bob. So in the UGI, I've got a little entity called Bob. Uh, that credential is magically made away, but I can say do something with Bob, do as. And here I'm basically saying, I want the file system here. And that point, I have an access, I have Bob's access to HGFS, because the file system here, instance I've got, I can make calls, rewrite, open, delete files. They're Bob's files, not Alice's. So, that works all the way through the Dupe RPC calls. So if I'm implementing, um, avoiding REST completely here, if you're implementing Hadoop RPC APIs, with a bit of extra effort, you turn on Kerberos and then callers can pass their credentials up to you as well so you can then act on their behalf. This stuff is incredibly low level. <coughs> I will gloss over a bit because unless you're actually writing code at this level, it will kind of scare you. I think the key point is to do it properly is the APIs let you authenticate, but they don't do authorization checks. And if you're running a long-lived application, you have to deal with the fact your tokens expire. The way we generally do that, in all the bits of code I've worked on, is you pass a key tab up when you launch it. You say, here is the key tab. And it just lasts forever. There is another strategy, which is you have a client application which pushes out a new set of tokens every 24, 48 hours. You better not forget, but it means you don't have to worry about key tabs and all that kind of stuff. Some organizations, and I will call out Yahoo especially, really do not issue tokens. They don't give key tabs out to anybody, really. So actually, this I remember to update my, my tokens every day or so is actually a better strategy. It's a strategy that means you can get your code working without going near the ops people, which is always nice. Um, I'm not going into details, actually. Um, key thing is, if you have an RPC class and Hoop APIs, you add a bit of extra annotation at the top saying, Kerberos info, here's my principal and names of the file. That's a name in the Hadoop configuration file that the client then looks at to say, who do I try and talk to? You add some extra classes and metadata, and it all magically works, usually, so it doesn't work. At that point, save an RPC API, here's my kill container request. All I do is, in that method that handles the RPC calls, I say, well, give me the current user. If it doesn't know who you are, you're in trouble. Well, I says, right, give me the current user. At that point, I have the information that I can act. When I call the UGI, it says, Okay, Bob's calling me. That, that's your credentials, whatever. That's the identity that's come through. At that point, you have to add your own authorization. It's not, now you know who they are. You actually say, do they have the rights? Is Bob allowed to kill my container? That's it. Yes or no. You should log it, at the very least, say what they're doing. It's always good to have audit logs. And then you authenticate. <coughs> so that's basically it. You, the user, you can, if you're doing an RPC API, you can add this stuff easily. You've got to all add all the grunge work underneath to actually check about access control information. Another acronym we all fear in this world is SASL. Anyone ever encountered that term? <coughs> I don't really remember what it means, but it's basically it's a kind of a, a meta protocol for a, a securing things. But basically, over a, a TCP channel, you can say, let's agree to have some kind of encryption mechanism. And SASL bootstraps off the authentication, supports various forms of channel authentication encryption, one of which is unencrypted. Plain. But generally, people say, oh, let's use SASL. It's kind of a way that things like Zookeeper and all of the various network channels authenticate and in 
encrypt with. So they secure the channel. It's kind of related in ways I don't fully understand, but it goes along there with it too. People that don't explain the protocols deal with it. You don't have to deal with it, apart from the fact the two words, SASL and GSS API, will appear in stack traces. And if you see that, you know this is where it's gone wrong. REST, we have something else, another acronym called Spinego. Um, it turns Kerberos authentication on in your web browser. If you turn Spinego on, on any web service, then your browser actually has, you have to be logged in on Kerberos and your browser has to be set up right. And then you actually, your browser will authenticate with the back end using Kerberos. And it works really well with Firefox. Okay with Chrome. Okay with Safari. Not at all with Internet Explorer. So if anybody out there was still using Internet Explorer, nobody nods. You shouldn't. Um, it also works with the Sun, it works with Curl. Well, you know, Curl works quite nicely. And Sun's Oracle's now Jersey client library for talking REST with the Java net URLs. Normally I'm a fan of Apache code, but the Apache HTTP client libraries are just, they just don't. Even when their own documentation says it <coughs> might work, it's kind of a warning sign, right? Um, if you're curious, if you don't want to write all this code yourself to talk to the authorization tokens and that, there are three different implementations inside the Hadoop code base to, t to do all this stuff, all of which are marked private. So I'm looking for volunteers from the audience to implement this thing. Hadoop 1185. Provide a public one that's stable. Okay, volunteers, welcome. Anyway, it does work. And um, once you've actually got it working, then, well, you've basically got a secure communication over REST APIs, which is very nice. Except, of course, you have to be sure it works, which is why the fact that us developers are lazy and slack and don't test on secure clusters suffer. The good news is you can avoid all that pain at release time by doing it up front. The bad news is you then have to start using security early on and it hurts. The way I'm dealing with it now is I have, a, I have some VMs which have Kerberos turned on. And also, normally Kerberos issues tickets to expire about 24 hours. I have my ticket lifetime set to one hour. So basically, if anything's going wrong with ticket expiry, whatever, things timing out is gonna happen within about an hour. And generally I'll notice, one time I was doing the problem, I set it down to about 15 minutes. And yes, I found a bug in the code. It stops you waiting until two days after you ship. You know, so go through the effort, set up a Kerberos domain controller by hand, learn how to read Kerberos configuration files, that kind of stuff, because you will eventually be needing to read them at some point. So just do the grunge work yourself. And it's important because when Kerberos goes wrong, it will go wrong in a way that provides no meaningful information whatsoever. Here are some random error messages that will appear up. Check some fail. Failure unspecified at GSS API level, check some fail. Anyone guess what that means? Guess what means? No. Your password was wrong. That's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> no valid credentials provided, illegal key size. That one means your JVM doesn't have the Java crypto extensions on to work abroad. It's a good one because it can come back automatically when you're not paying attention. Um, server not found in Kerberos database. Your machine doesn't know its own name is a good one. It says who you say you are, but DNS up says you aren't. So this whole collection of these things that are utterly meaningless. What I've been trying to do now is actually document them and say this is possibly what caused them. And we're sticking that up online just so that when other people find these problems, they will at least have a vague idea where to begin. <laughs> Otherwise, they're absolutely meaningless. There are a couple of secret switches you can turn on to help debug stuff. Um, just bear in mind that, again, it's all documented. The key one is you can tell the JVM to start printing stuff out to standard error as to what's going on. It's vast amounts of meaningless stuff. When things start going wrong, it's, for, it, it, it's really important to have, though. So during development, turn this stuff on and just learn how to debug your own development <laughs> setup, and you will learn how to read the stuff in production. Which brings me to a more fundamental issue, which I believe that not only are there Java libraries who are working with Kerberos atrocious and utterly informative, in the Hadoop code base, that's Tom and me, we haven't helped because we generally don't actually, we, we tend to subtract information by wrapping the exception with something else meaningless like didn't work. And, you know, taking things away rather than helping you. So I have a little plan here. 
year in number one, two, six, four, nine. I was on it. <coughs> or as I like to call it, the fucking Fix Kerberos Initiative. That's an unofficial name. We haven't stood up on any podium and gladly announced it. But basically, it's a list there of things we could do to actually make it possible to debug why things don't work, essentially make them more useful, more error messages, better diagnostics, anything like that to help debug stuff. And it's funny because it's not on those grand strategic things. You won't get big companies up on the podium going, hey, we're going to fix Kerberos. It's going to be less awful. But actually, you start doing this, and you come to go, oh, there's poor people go, oh, that's nice. Can we have that? And then the QE people say, oh, we like that. We want to do our tests, and we don't want to, we don't want to test the entire Hadoop cluster if that installation's broken. You know what I mean? It's like Kerberos isn't working. We're just going to waste time. So I've started on this. Volunteers are all welcome. I'm going to give a very quick demo at the end of some of this stuff working. KDiag is its first liberal, Kerberos Diagnostics. We just prints out all that low-level stuff of what's going on, tries to log you in, tries to log you out. Just tries to, and it, as it's doing all this stuff, it just prints all the craft out, okay? Let's give a demo. Hmm, how do I get the right one? Get one of these. So here, we're running Kerberos Diag, and it's going to say, So I'm not logged in on Kerberos now. There's a little VM locally doing this stuff. And I type my KDI command. This is shipping in 2.8. If you're using Hadoop, earlier versions of Hadoop, I've stuck it up on GitHub standalone because it works there too. We've already started fielding at any support call related to Kerberos on a cluster. We just say, go run this. Stick everything that gets printed out as an attachment in the bug report, and we'll see what we can do. So it prints out large amounts of useless stuff, but it prints out things like, yes, we have more, we support more than 100, you know, 256 bits or whatever. We're using Sun's libraries and not the IBM ones, which break differently. Random cruft about lots of class path stuff. If you ever wonder why you get class path problems in Hadoop, that's why. Okay. Uh, sad but true. Environment variables that are vaguely useful. All the relevant Hadoop cruft. Or, Kerberos files. We're actually working with Intel. We're actually going to start parsing these Kerberos configuration files and looking up host. Machine really know when you are. Is it consistent? That kind of stuff. So this one fails saying, hey, you're not really logged in. Okay, let's boom. Do it again. And it's nice. It should better work itself. So it's happy now. I know, it's not particularly exciting. If you're ever trying to debug a Hadoop cluster, you will be absolutely excited about this as a beginning for meaningfulness. And it's the kind of steps on trying to fix what's going on. I work on an open source project. The way we have the philosophy is that I'm free to work in my spare time on whatever bit of the open source project I find interesting. This bit of work here, nobody's working on it full time. We're working on it more in what's described as crisis time, meaning you know, if something's not working, we will be the ones that have to run and fix it. So that's when we try and extend this stuff and diagnose it. Volunteers are welcome here. All right, that's basically it. There's more volunteers are welcome. Now, I've done a quick overview of what's going on. I would love people to come and help. All the stuff that I have, all those error messages, the things I've documented here today, we're all sticking online. Because the other deliverable of this work is actually trying to document what on earth is going <coughs> on. Yeah. And so I'm slowly creating a git book on this very topic, Hadoop and Kerberos, the madness beyond the gate. We now know it. And it's slowly evolving. We're trying to document exactly what's going on. Its goal is ultimately it will become the effectively the non-normative guide to what on earth goes on in Hadoop and Kerberos. And so if you ever start playing in this world, when you start seeing obscure error messages, then it should be your first port of call. Um, I am not going to recommend a second port of call. I'm not promising I'm not going to answer any support calls. Um, you know, if you pay Azure Cloud Error, somebody will deal with it, and eventually it will make its way to somebody like myself or Tom. But please, when it comes to Kerberos, don't email me direct, OK? I beg you for that. Um, I have this theory that somebody who wants to make lots of money should just be a startup whose aim in life is purely to debug Kerberos problems around the world. And I don't want to be in that team, but I think it was really nice to have somebody in that team. You know, There's an opportunity there for somebody that likes suffering. 
I'm not joking. You think I'm being ironic, don't you? This whole thing, I mean, if you play with it, you realize that it's just an absolute nightmare where things just don't work. Current problem, for example, is some of our QE tests, something comes up and it won't talk to the the file system unless you restart it. Who knows? And it's just kind of like, it's replicable. No obvious reasons why, though. So I just like, you know, just absolute nightmare when things go wrong. And it's just, it's a combination of you've got some of the world's largest distributed systems integrating with <coughs> things like Active Directory. You know, and they buy things like one problem is related to some bank where they bought this extra security thing from Dell that was in the way and issuing things. It's basically, okay, well, even though our protocol says, yes, you can renew Kerberos tickets, this little thing was turning that feature off and saying, no, you can't. And it's like, what can you do? Because you can't really go to the network security people and say, turn this security feature off so this system over here will work. They'll basically say, no, we're a bank. You know, you can't do that. So it's a, it's a nightmare. The irony is, of course, is that actually the web companies that wrote this stuff didn't have to worry about things because people like Google and Yahoo and that don't care about your personal privacy or anything like that, so they can just collect it all and have it wide open. But the more enterprising people, like supermarkets, do actually care a bit about keeping your shopping purchasing data secret. So Kerberos is out there. It's inevitable. Deal with it by starting early would be my recommendation. Even though it hurts, it's out there, and you're just going to have to deal with it. Now, are there any questions? Yes? I do have one, but it relates to specific slides. The delegation tokens, are they particularly targeted at the thing that's going across on your behalf, or is it a general purpose? Can you say a set of those? You know, how much scope do you have over the control of what happens with that? Okay, a delegation token, they're kind of issued by the services themselves. If you don't really say who they're going to, you just say, I would like a delegation token so somebody could act on behalf of Steve for the next six hours or whatever, something like that. You get this token, you can then forward it on to anything that you then say acts on my behalf. And so they, they're done by different services. So they, the services may offer different rights, but normally just say, give me a token. So this person pretends to be Steve for a while. There will then be a standard API, really, for refreshing the token over IPC or for some of the things over REST as well, where the UGI code starts up a thread in the background that refreshes them sporadically. So you can keep going for a few hours. As long as you're still trusted, as long as the token hasn't been revoked, it'll get renewed, renewed, renewed. Otherwise, when the time's up, they stop working anymore, your code will fail, people will see stack traces, um, and people will be unhappy. Is there a live replication thing, or is that simply that I won't be able to renew it when it's expired? Generally, right, I don't know the answer to that question actually. Um, they can be revoked, okay, if the process basically, normally like a service like the HS file system will actually maintain a table of tokens that it's issued for a while, so you can revoke it and it will say, yeah, I will do a check, okay? Also, after a token's been renewed, you get a new token back. If somebody has the old token, it's not valid anymore. So can I use this? Because no, 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 that's gone away, stop it. So it's the same kind of implicit, it's not in the table kind of look up. It's interesting, because you have a table to maintain like that, it does complicate things like failover, because now you've got more state that you have to preserve, okay? which is one of the problems. I don't know how people deal with it, actually. Not looked at that particular code. I try and avoid looking at the security code. I point out that it's just it finds me because you can't really help it. And unfortunately, now I've started to look at it enough to know my way around. People start asking me questions about it. You know, they soon realise I don't know that much about it, which is fine. But it's just I know a bit. It's just slightly more than other people. I do have one other question. Um, so that looked like it's written on top of JAS. Ah, uh, we're not going to go into that. So my question is, <laughs> can you editorialise about that a little bit? Um, what do you make of it? Is it? Does it do the job well? Or is it... All right, so things I ignored here, HTTPS, full REST, groups. The magic environment variable Hadoop user and Hadoop proxy user. In insecure cluster, you set the environment variable Hadoop user, and you are whoever you say you are. Um, yeah, Jazz sucks, that's what you need to know. Um, it's a Java API and a text file to describe what your configuration is. 
Nobody understands the text files. They're not documented. It turns out on Windows, you better use double escape backslashes. No one ever documented that. It needs to be, you have to have different settings for the IBM and Oracle JVMs. Again, utterly undocumented. Um, in UGI, it tries to get set automatically for you behind the scenes. Okay, it creates one and all is well, except when it's not well, in which case you have no idea what's going on and you might have to learn this stuff by hand. Okay? Jazz is, I can't remember what it actually does now. It kind of defines a bit like who you're talking to and how you authenticate. If you're trying to use Secure Zookeeper, this thing needs to be set up. HBase kind of uses it too. The rest of Hadoop doesn't really, really need it. So Zookeeper uses SAS and, sorry, Sazzle and Jazz to make life wonderfully complicated. Um, I had this problem where actually uh, December we're trying to do a product release, what we're at KDAG for, where Zookeeper just wouldn't trust my code. Everything else in the cluster says, yep, you're authenticated and licensed. Zookeeper goes, no, I don't trust you. And it wasn't the failing error message back to the client saying, no, I don't trust you. It was basically connection closed. And my client's going, okay, Zookeeper connection closed, I better try connecting another Zookeeper server in the cluster somewhere as part of my failover. There's only one, so you get a lot of retry, going, oh, connection down, retry, connection down, retry. Kind of different problems. You go to the Zookeeper logs and it goes, oh, this person will authenticate it. It's like, well, why didn't you tell the client? And I never did work out, well, I worked out roughly why it wasn't authenticating, which I'd created my Kerberos cluster 364 days earlier. And the key tabs expire in 365 days, and it's saying, oh, you've got less than 24 hours to run, so I don't trust you. You know, but it's kind of a meaningless, meaningless problem. So, one, client wasn't me told anything. Two, the server was logging something internally and it was meaningless. Who knew? Anyway, I don't like Zookeeper, I don't like Jazz. That's all I'm saying. Does anybody else have any questions? I've got a question. Tom. Um, Anyone else other than Tom? <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the test and the unit test and integration test situation? I think there's a mini. KDC. Mini KDC. Is that used in Hadoop itself? Right, I actually wrote right, right, the Mini KDC. Hadoop has Mini HDFS, or Mini HDFS cluster in VM. Time's up. Okay, we're going to stop. I'll talk about it later. The answer is it exists, but it's not really any good. All right? <laughs> uh, it, the thing about it is it lets you log on once, but it doesn't let you log on as two principles simultaneously. So you can't actually do tests to say this resource has been committed created by Alice, can user Bob, can I assert that user Bob can't actually read it? Okay, which is really what you want to do, is not just does it work, but is it secure? You can't do that. There is some work going on, Apache project called Apache Kirby, which is an attempt to implement a whole new Kerberos controller, and I have hope there, and we're talking to them about not just initially for testing, but actually replacing the Oracle entire SASL API, which is atrocious performance with something that is fast that will use all the Intel native encryption coding, if present, and be an, an API that's actually far more memory and performance efficient. So it will basically make the cost of encrypting your channel almost free, effectively, on modern parts. So I have plans there. I am not going to get involved in it myself because I hate Kerberos. Volunteers are welcome, especially Hadoop committers with time on their hands. Tom's a Hadoop committer, that's what he's called. Did you ever write any of UGI? Have you ever been near it? No, I, I profess ignorance of anything. That is the absolute best thing to do. Unfortunately, git commit logs don't lie, do they, Tom? <coughs> do they? Well, they do. We have to create fake usernames. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's it. If you have any problems, there's a git book up there. You can find it and read this stuff, okay? <laughs>